So the writer and creator of The Exorcist personally brings to the screen his own continuation to that story in a film that ran into a lot of studio opposition, but became the most respected continuation of that franchise, the name Peter Blatty's Legion, otherwise better known as The Exorcist 3. Fifteen years after the death and sacrifice of Father Damien Karras, Lieutenant William Kinnerman and Father Joseph Dyer attempt to cheer one another up by seeing It's a Wonderful Life together. Afterwards, Kinnerman and Dyer talk theological worldviews and discuss the gruesome murder of a young boy named Thomas Kindry, who was decapitated and crucified by the river. Soon thereafter, Father Camp is murdered in the confessional by the same methods, including being injected with a paralyzing drug that kept the victim fully conscious during the brutal murder. Yet the fingerprints lifted at the two crime scenes do not match, indicating they are committed by two different people. Following a jovial hospital visit to Father Dyer who is in for supposedly routine tests in neurology, Kinnerman has an ethereal dream of angels and familiar faces, including Dyer's, as a haunting harbinger. The following day, he learns that Father Dyer has been murdered in the same manner as his other two victims, with his entire blood supply also drained into neat vials with a message on the wall, written in his blood. This ultimately leads Kinderman to reveal to Drs. Friedman and Temple along with Sergeant Atkins that all three murders match the M.O. of the Gemini Killer, a serial murderer who was executed 15 years ago, an M.O. that was never released to the press. All his victims were decapitated, with their right index figure severed, with the zodiac sign of the Gemini on their left palm. Furthermore, the killer would send letters gloating to the press, always doubling his final L's, such as the message left in Father Dyer's room. Nurse Allerton reports that one of their psych ward patients, Mrs. Clelia, was found in the hallway at the time of Father Dyer's reported death, but questioning the quasi canatine gets the lieutenant nowhere, yet a visit to the disturbed ward with Dr. Temple is unknowingly the key to this mystery. Later, the lieutenant meets with the head of the church, Father Riley, who eventually connects all the murders together through the McNeil possession case. The Kentry boy's mother helped Karras investigate his audio recordings of Reagan. Father Canavan was the one who sanctioned the exorcism, and Dyer was Karras' closest friend. When the fingerprints of Dyer's crime scene match to Mrs. Clelia, Kinnaman is called to Dr. Temple's office, who reveals that the man in the third ward was brought in 15 years ago wandering the streets with amnesia, and only came out of a coma a few weeks ago, claiming that he is the Gemini killer. Worse yet, Bill Kinnerman believes that the man is actually Damien Karras. The patient divulges to Kinnerman details of a Gemini killing that was never released to the press, as well as how Father Dyer's intricate sanguination and murder occurred. While the man looks like Damien Karras, Beneath the surface lies James Veneman, the Gemini Killer, placed there as retribution for the McNeil exorcism, utilizing catatonics to carry out his murders. Yet Kinnerman's disbelief motivates another horrific murder to occur, with Nurse Amy Keating that night. Dr. Temple subsequently commits suicide in the face of his fear of the Gemini Killer, whom he aided along the way. Ultimately, belief and faith will have to combat this horrific evil, in order to free Karras from this blood-curdling killer and the diabolical demon to orchestrate this heinous possession. So August 17, 1990 saw the theatrical release of The Exorcist 3, written and directed by William Peter Blatty, adapted from his novel Legion, which was published in 1983, 12 years after the publication of the original Exorcist novel, which works out fine because the actual novel of Legion takes place 12 years after the fact of the events of that other novel, but when you get into the release dates of the actual films, where the original Exorcist was released in 1973, and this one actually takes place in 1990, it was released in 1990, and it says it takes place 15 years after the fact of the events of the first film, which means that everything retroactively takes place in 1975, not 1973, so it's a little bit of jockeying of timelines that maybe Bloody just felt like it was maybe too long of a thing to kind of stretch out to 17 years, or what the case was. And this is even further solidified by the original opening entire film, which is kind of a slight flashback to like just after the events of the first film where Bill Kinderman's going in and identifying the corpse of Damien Karras and 
same stamp as Georgetown 1975. So particular type of things in that regard, how that kind of just shifts things just a little bit off in that regard. But how this film came to be, because you had all the stuff fantastic with the original film, which I covered in a very long, fantastic video. But then there came Exorcist to the Heretic, which was just a film that was made by people who didn't have the reference for freaking Blatty's film. And they just went off in different directions, didn't really understand what the original film was about, didn't really care so much, and took it off such a weird, almost psychedelic art house type of film to a such a degree. It just, it did not get well received, didn't make a whole lot of the box office, had like a $30 million take off of a $14 million budget. A film that was so poorly received that they pulled it from theaters and went into theaters themselves, re editing the actual theatrical film reels to kind of trim it down and kind of reconstruct the whole thing to a smaller, shorter runtime. Major mess from John Borman, the director of the entire thing, did not go over well with a lot of people. And that was so much of a thing why, when Blatty was going into this thing, he wanted to maintain the name of Legion and not call it The Exorcist 3 because him and Friedkin absolutely did not like the heretic whatsoever. Thought it had no business whatsoever being connected to their film. And just like, Calling it the Exorcist 3, pretty much acknowledges there was an Exorcist 2. <laughs> and the interesting thing is, like, okay, some of the early teaser trailers kind of called it Exorcist 3 Legion. They gave it a subtitle, but that kind of got pulled out at a certain point in time for the marketing materials, and so it just became the Exorcist 3. And Bloody and Freak are actually developing this entire idea back in the 70s as their own proper sequel to The Exorcist, but after the original actor for William Kinder actually passed away, Lee J. Cobb, back in the 70s, and Warner Bros. decided to go in this different direction with a heretic. Everything just kind of dissolved in that regard, and Freakin was still kind of batting around, actually going off and being the one to direct it himself after a certain point, but it kind of dissolved to a certain degree. And actually, John Carpenter was actually courted. It's like him and Blatty actually had conversations back in like 89 or something else like that about Carpenter actually coming on and actually being the one to direct the entire film. But Carpenter was kind of like seeing the whole thing as like, Blatty is getting the real strong vibe. Blatty just wants to do this himself, and he already directed his own film before, The Ninth Configuration, also known as Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane, which is a very heavy theological kind of comedy type of film to a certain degree, but had a lot of heavy things going on with it, but has a lot of the same cast mainstays that you see come up in The Exorcist 3, also known as Legion. And so just the whole thing, like, Blatty just was, was very passionate about the entire idea that he here, getting up to make it himself, eventually got optioned by Morgan Creek, and... I don't know how the rights for the Exorcist franchise got from Warner Brothers or to Morgan Creek because they're the ones who made this one. They made the two prequel films and then they eventually sold everything to Universal for their attempt for a new franchise trilogy and stuff like that and who knows whatever. But somewhere along the way, everything went from Warner Brothers or to Morgan Creek and they produced this film and things got very much kind of a really great opposition between him and the studio. And some other people had a little bit of a friction in terms of how bloody went a about doing production, how he directed the film to a certain degree, because he apparently just had a very strong, kind of rigid approach in how he wanted the film to actually come out. He wanted to come out a very particular type of way, and some people were saying, like, he wasn't quite as collaborative, he wasn't quite as flexible in certain places here to kind of bend his ideas and kind of go in different directions and whatnot when people kind of interject some sort of suggestions or some recommendations or some criticisms. It's very much the type of thing where he was just very much on track to make exactly the film he wanted to make, and very much as close of a faithful adaptation from his novel as possible. And there's a lot of things from the novel that don't make it into the film. Now, a lot of these things are just condensing things and kind of streamlining the story and kind of compacting things, condensing so it can fit into a two-hour narrative. But there's a lot of different elements to the whole thing as I've went through the audiobook and the whole thing, which is fairly decent audiobook in that regard. It's not great, but it gives you a lot of the full text. It's unabridged. And the fact of the matter is, the Gemini Killer actually has a full backstory in the novel. And the reason why he's called the Gemini Killer is the fact that he had a twin brother called Thomas. And the fact is, this evangelistic father named Carl was actually a drunken, abusive father who actually beat Thomas and actually died at a certain point in time, and is actually called Tommy Sunlight in the novel. And so he's going off killing all these people in the name of this father who he wants to shame because he battered and bruised and killed his own brother. And all these different things come to a head in that regard. So it's like it's much more of a deeper underlying motivation of why he's doing what he's doing, and much more about the actual father 
ties into the original ending for the novel, where the fact is it's much more of a lesser ending to a certain degree, but something that has much more context for the character himself, why he's doing what he's doing, and actually, again, give you a reason why he's called the Gemini Killer himself, which is very much kind of slightly based on the Zodiac killings that took place in San Francisco in the 1960s. We're also in the novel, the Gemini killings don't happen in Richmond, they happen in San Francisco. And Dr. Temple is actually a psychological consultant on the Gemini killing, so he has a much deeper integration into that story there, so he knows all about the killings, and now he's a psychiatrist at the actual hospital where the actual reincarnated version of the Gemini killer is being contained. So it's very much a lot of integrated type of things in that regard, so interesting type of stuff how but he kind of re-looked really at some of the stuff and kind of condensed it and kind of moved it off to here and kind of omitted certain other things. And there's certain other things in terms of like entire character is removed for the entire film. There's a character called Dr. Vincent M. Fortis, who's actually this guy who actually works in the psych ward and stuff like that. But his storyline is the fact that he lost his wife some time ago and is actually ailing from actual untreated mental condition that's actually kind of affecting his mental capacity to a certain degree. And, he seems to be kind of hallucinating at certain points in time, and there's kind of maybe an ambiguity that maybe he's involved in the entire killings or whatnot, but very much this different type of story that kind of taps on some things that are present in the film itself, such as all this sort of like EVP, this electronic voice phenomenon stuff that you kind of get where people think they're hearing dead voices through the radios and stuff like that. It's kind of planted here and there when the dream sequence and certain things with Mrs. Claylia, some things here and there. So it's, it's a much bigger issue in the novel that kind of gets for, more fully explored through this and Fortis character who actually has a weird sort of doppelganger scene where he's kind of like again mental illness and stuff like that kind of affecting him to a certain degree where he's actually talking about like uh, evil doppelganger of himself where the actor of Nicole Williamson is actually not mentioned inside the novel himself and actually ends up being in the film of The Exorcist 3 as Father Paul Mourning so it's a very interesting type of thing because Williamson was actually going to be one of the leads in the ninth configuration, but was eventually taken over by Stacey Keach. So a lot of weird type of things just kind of really interconnecting, a lot of interesting weird ideas and these connective tissues over all the place that were just kind of filtering in through Platy's creative imagination going into this novel. And there's a lot of other things in that regard as well that I'll kind of touch on as you move forward the entire analysis of the entire film here. And one thing that's never terribly sort of noted about the Exorcist history is that it was financially successful. It garnered about $44 million at the box office over an $11 million budget, so Quadruple's budget did very well for itself. Not nearly as much as the original film, but definitely on gross, the second film did much better than that. And the reviews are a little bit kind of here and there in a certain way, and the Simmons score it garnered from opening weekend audiences was only a C, which is not, not good whatsoever, but the fact that it got that much back at the box office is certainly probably built up over and over again over the home view markets of the cable sales, stuff like that, did fairly well for itself. Did very well for itself. And the fact that the film has garnered so much more sort of critical reappraisal and stuff like that over the years very much shows how there's a lot of strong ailments with what Blatty did here. Even based off the theatrical, which is a compromised version from his original vision, which again was actually put together in 2016 by Screen Factory to actually approximate from available materials the best version of the film they could possibly put together for it. But I like so much what Blatty does here, just, just from his writing, which we know is phenomenal. He's a fantastic writer, just like, I guess it'd be a little bit lighter in some places here than he could with the original Exorcist. And so much what a lot of people kind of latch onto is the dialogue. He's so good with the dialogue here because he's so good at drawing such rich characters. You know, so many different things in the whole thing. Like, again, how you move from Kinderman, from the original film, now he's a little bit more world-weary. He's a little bit more, maybe a tad, tad bit apathetic. It's just like, he's got a little bit of a drain on his soul in that regard to seeing so much death and so much grimness, it's all the crimes and the homicides he's worked. It really kind of wore on him. From the events of the original film and the original novel, kind of just drained him to a certain degree. So you can definitely see that character was done in the original film by Lee J. Cobb, transitioning in this version portrayed by George C. Scott and have all these different qualities that still harken back to that character you knew from the previous film and the previous novel. And the fact you get so many of these great moments of just the sharp, rich dialogue they have between Dyer and Kinderman, so much. All those other things kind of throw 
so much of the memorable qualities about the entire film. People remember those lines so much. Everything they're talking about, the carp scene and various other things. It's like there's a lot of great pieces of dialogue. We're just snapping back and forth and there are such great actors putting the roles to really grasp onto that stuff very, so very well. I just like how he creates these characters so much to create substance. He creates distinguished qualities about every single character he puts into the film and casts them so very well. But you really do have to nail so much about the cinematography in the film, which is done by Jerry Fisher, who he'd worked with on the Ninth Configuration, also shot Wolfen and Highlander. So you know this film looks fantastic and it does adapt to that style because you know Highlander. Sweeping landscapes, big wide-angle lenses, all these interesting sort of operatic things. It's much more of a still film. Blighty doesn't want to move the camera around too much. He really likes to kind of set the film right there and have this wide frame, almost like a stage play to a certain degree. A lot of different scenes in the entire film could definitely play out as a stage production. We have Kinderman and the Gemini Killer there in the cell. It's lit so perfectly with the, the two streaming lights coming out, just going off on the entire actors there in the entire scene. It's wonderful type of stuff, just seeing that play out in that regard. And of course, the entire scene where after Dyer's been killed, and the entire scene with Kinderman and his team inside the hospital room, just these great sort of angles and shots, just like, they're just great compositions that really kind of strike out so very strongly because, again, you're not doing a lot of camera tricks. You're not doing a lot of things moving around or whatnot. You're letting the images kind of sink into the audience so very well. And I very much appreciate that type of thing. It kind of makes me think of Walter Hill. Stuff like he did in The Driver, some other things here and there. Where it's like his very sparse, minimalistic type of stuff he's doing with the camera. But there's such rock-solid camera setups that just tell a story so much, so very well. And the fact that even though the ninth configuration was shot cinemascope, he maintained the 1.85 to 1 frame that was done for the original extras. They maintained that sort of visual continuity for one film to the next. And I just think everything comes off very well, just like the lighting of the whole thing. It has a very delicate sensibility of how he wants to kind of paint a little bit here and there, which is a splash of light in some places here and there, just create a little bit of mood and ambiance. And they come together so well, just like when the, when the film really kind of taps a little bit into that ominous sensibility or something else like that. The lighting just really kind of comes alive just and we just kind of start bringing certain things like it's an organic piece of the entire film. Again, when you're in that hospital room and the looking over all the things, the vials of the blood and everything like that, like the fact there's a certain point in time when you turn the camera over to the cross on the wall and the storm comes in and all the clouds kind of cover up the light that was shining. It's like very smart subtle little pieces of symbolism in that regard. It's like, it's not saying this striking out strong, but just it's it's symbolic towards what the feeling and the mood of the story is moving towards so very much. So it's like a very expressionistic to certain degrees, but not jumping out at you in that regard. So it's like everything Jerry Fisher does in the entire film to make it look so very good. Know when to move the camera, not to move the camera. There's no when you need a nice sort of city cam shot here and there to move through certain sets or just kind of lock the thing down to let everything play out with the actors and all that type of stuff and having very long takes. As a filmmaker myself, I've already kind of appreciate doing long takes. I like to have the actors work the scene for a long stretch of time so they can get into the rhythms and stuff like that, really kind of play the scene to a certain degree and maybe play things out in a long city cam shot or something else like that, just to have that sort of thing come to the forefront of having the actors kind of express and make the rhythms of the scene work for themselves and kind of work along with that. So. I very much appreciate that entire quality that Blatty brought to the whole thing. But very much the interesting type of thing is kind of the score for the whole thing, which was done by Barry DeVorzon, who I know very much from doing the score for The Warriors for Walter Hill, speaking of such things. And he went to a very much different approach here. If you know the stuff from Warriors, it's very much kind of this funky 70s soundtrack in a certain way, so much right on the pulse of pop culture and that thing. But this thing, it's almost like it is taking a little bit of a cue from the original Exorcist. It's not doing library tracks, aside from a little bit of thing with two real bells at the beginning. It's pretty much kind of using textures and sound effects and kind of synthesizers here and there just create just a texture across the background in the entire film. Not kind of doing notes and kind of scoring things orchestrally or doing even like a Tangerine Dream or John Carpenter type of synth score. It's pretty much using a very much a different approach to the entire thing that is eventually going to be released by Waxwork Records on vinyl later on in 2024, but as the time of making this whole thing, it's not been commercially available up to this point, 
but it's very much a nice thing that they'll actually be going off and making that thing commercially available. So it's gonna be an interesting listening experience because it's not saying that plays as a normal sc score. If you watch a film that kind of plays as an accentuation of what's happening on screen so much to highlight the underlying textures and the underlying tensions that our film really much has. So it's a very interesting type of thing how all that stuff comes together with the fantastic stingers and the kind of growls going on in certain places here. They're just kind of guttural sort of demonic sounds. It's like it's a really wonderful unique type of piece they put together in the entire film and it works so very very well with Blatty and the whole thing really kind of nailing down a certain sensibility that some of the producers were kind of at odds about how much they really felt like he was much of a, a right fit the entire thing but definitely nailed it so very well and the cast of the entire film god damn talk about nailing things again i already mentioned george e scott here moving on from what lee j cobb did so beautifully in the original exorcist film and i like the fact that scott was this interesting actor didn't always take on the most high profile things didn't take on the most splashy type of things but he was always so consistently good and the fact that it's not even the first horror film he did. He did The Changeling in 1980. He did Firestarter. Doing very, very unique and different performances in all three of these films. He put in some amazing type of work. And even though he won an Oscar for Patton, the fact that he didn't actually show up and accept the whole thing on certain principles in some ways, he still showed he had these great natural instincts of how to find the characters, find the emotional beats, and find the dramatic sensibilities to really harness them into a great performance, really kind of drive things to a certain degree, how he does things. And there might have been a little bit of friction between him and Blatty, but they worked on things very professionally, and I think he's phenomenal in the entire film. He has to work with all these different tones. He got kind of funny stuff between him and Dyer, all these wonderful comedic quips that Blatty, again, was originally a comedy writer. He adds all the humanity for these characters into those scenes, but he's also kind of deal with this entire sensibility that, again, he, he's got all these years as a homicide cop, and he just feels kind of weary. And then, of course, the grief as well, but when once Dyer gets killed, all the stuff keeps weighing on him so much. I like so much that scene after he's been going through the hospital and, and trying to figure things out and kind of organize things. And he's walking there with Grand Old Butch as Sergeant Atkins and just has that moment where just like everything just kind of catches up to him and just like he gets lightheaded, feel like he's going to pass out. I like that quality about the character. It just shows the emotional toll of everything that's going on with the character where you see as he goes through the entire, entire film, you're almost surprised that he just doesn't crumble and collapse the entire film under the weight of everything he's dealing with. The death of his friend, these gruesome almost inexplicable murders. How can all this be connected to the MO of a guy who died 15 years ago? It's all this stuff that's kind of swirling around him and I like the fact that he still maintains the qualities he had in The Exorcist. That he has that perceptive quality. That he's not terribly intrusive. He's not always barreling through things. He's definitely emotional. He's definitely flared up in certain points in time in a way that's very much understandable. But I like the quality of that when he's dealing with certain things, he's trying to just perceive deeper into everything here, trying to pick up on the little clues, trying to rationalize, trying to calculate and sort of decipher what's going on around him. Find the way for the pieces of the puzzle to interlock and find a way to make sure that they all come to some sensible conclusion. Even if it is beyond reason, even if it's beyond any rational sensibility that he has, he still follows it along. I like all these qualities and that sort of apathy, the sort of weariness on the character does kind of circle back at the end of the theatrical cut, which is called The Exorcist 3, when Kinner is pinned up against the wall and the Gemini killer saying, have I helped your own belief? It's like, oh yes, I believe in death, I believe in murder, I believe in infidelity, I believe in every ugly thing imaginable. I believe in you. And it's a very pertinent type of thing, I believe, for Kinderman, the fact that he's got this such an apathetic sensibility, just like he's talking with Dyer early in the film, and he's talking about how he found the Kentry boy, he's decapitated, and crucified, and all these different things. It horrifies Dyer. And you definitely see all these things, just you see how seeing stuff like that, even not even that extreme, can really just drain the guy all over the place. It's so much more pertinent in the novel when he's kind of having all these ponderous thoughts about nature of matter in the universe. He's dealing with theology. He's thinking about intelligent design. It's like all these different things kind of weave in as much more trying to make sense of these belief systems, all the different stuff. What does any of it really mean? When does it actually come to a head that has anything that comes to, to make sense of it all? 
And like Dyer says, oh, it works out at the end of time. It's like, oh, that soon. And just all this stuff, just, it just, a very, very thick and kind of woven type of stuff in the novel that doesn't quite get as much play in the film itself. But I feel like at least with the theatrical cut ending, the Exorcist 3 ending with the exorcism, all that type of stuff, but especially with that scene between him and the Gemini talking about belief. I think it has a pertinent sensibility about what Kinderman has gone through. And it's like if he can believe in what the Gemini killer is. Maybe he's open to believing other things as well in the wider scope of the world. So it's a very interesting type of stuff, just how Scott just goes in this entire thing and he's phenomenally good. He's such a magnificently well-rounded actor, just brought so much wealth of substance to a character like this. So extremely well-written. It's like you just sunk into it so very effortlessly. It makes it look easy. He makes it look easy and probably wasn't, but he did a very good job. And certainly when they were doing a lot of the reshoots on the entire film that I'll talk about later on, he was a little bit combative, a little bit abrasive towards the process of it, but he still came to work and still did the work and still did a phenomenal job with it. And of course you got Ed Flanders here, his father, Joseph Dyer, and he was in the ninth configuration with Jason Miller and Scott Wilson for William Peter Blatty and so, but he really bring in some people he knew very well, could probably have a bit of a shorthand with him, kind of adapt to his writing and his directing style very, very comfortably. And of course, he's stepping in for a father, William O'Malley, who was dire in the original Exorcist. And so Ed Flanders was just much more of a seasoned actor to bring in this whole thing. You might have talked with O'Malley before actually casting the film, but definitely Flanders does a great job. Fantastic job. Just like, again, you got the great humorous beats. They're fantastic, all the type of stuff. Just really sharp chemistry between him and George E. Scott. But it's a little bit of a scene there where he's kind of talking about the other guy who was in the church there with him. And they're just talking about Damien Karras. And you just see that he's kind of holding back a little bit of emotion, a little bit of a grief. A little bit of an outpouring in some way. He's just like he's trying to kind of cut off the conversation before it kind of gets too deep into stuff he really just doesn't want to recollect on. So it's very much good character moment in that regard. And just the fact that the interesting type of thing is, that, okay, I love the relationship between Kinderman and Dyer. The fact they're both here on the anniversary of Karis' death, both trying to cheer the other up because they think they both get depressed all the thing. And so it's kind of a nice comedy of errors in that regard. It's not too much, but it's a nice sort of thing that they're both kind of playing it up. Like, I gotta, I gotta go cheer up Bill Kinderman. I gotta cheer up our friend Father Dyer. It's, it's a nice type of thing. It's a very nice dynamic to really kind of dear the characters to the audience so much. Get that sensibility of just the light playfulness between the two guys. It's a very nice type of thing. And the interesting thing is the fact that for years, as the original extras didn't have more than one scene between Karis and Kinderman, but the fact that this film says they were best of friends always made me think that there was something more in the original novel that never made it to the screen. Well, in the original novel, the extras, there is one additional scene between Karis and Kinderman before the actual exorcism happens. But it's a bit more of a thing about belief in theology. It's not so much that we could re-cement them as very good friends in that regard. And so Blatty actually admitted the fact that, yeah, I kind of smudged things a little bit. Just to make this story work a little bit better. To have that deeper connection between the two different characters. That they just didn't kind of meet and uh, depart from each other's lives within a day or so. Just kind of smudge things around. They kind of played up a little bit more for this story to have a bit more of a strong connection between... Damien Karras and Bill Kinderman. So a little bit of thing here and there, but I think it, it works so well to kind of play it this way that they did have a deeper relationship, even though it doesn't really play that well in any, either the text or the other film, but still kind of works in a vacuum in that regard to kind of play it off to a certain degree there. But talk about such things. Jason Miller was not originally cast in the film. In the original version of the film, the entire role of Damien Karras slash the Gemini Killer, James Veneman, is all played entirely by Brad Dourif. So they shot other scenes, they shot little photographs for reference showing back when they're in the tombs, part of the extended Legion cut. They showed the fact that Brad Dourif, in this continuity, in this context, he is, his visage is that of Damien Karras. In Legion cut, there is no actual soul or personality of Damien Karras surviving. It's the Gemini Killer in Karras' body, and that's it. So they added certain things in that thing, like I said with the original deleted opening. We're in there in the morgue, and Kinderman's looking over the corpse of Karras for identification, stuff like that. Then moving on to certain other things, like I said, 
reestablishing the fact that these are the actors portraying these characters in this version, and you don't have anything linking back to Jason Miller as Damien Karras. And the fact was, at least from Brad Dourif's recollection of certain things, the fact that Jason Miller was having certain alcoholic problems at the time and really couldn't memorize the long speeches and the monologues and stuff like that to really do the role properly. Now, obviously, as we see in the Exodus 3 cut, it does have certain long shots, long takes, where he actually is doing very good work on that regard. So, I don't know 100% certain about things, but apparently, I guess, Blighty did meet with Jason Miller and decided, well, he wasn't up to actually doing the whole role, so they got Brad Dourif for the entire thing. But before we move on to Dourif and his work, I do want to say that Jason Miller does a very fantastic job here doing what he has to do in this visage of kind of balancing a little bit, a little bit of Karis, but also playing this visage of Gemini Killer as Karis, and does a very creepy job of it. He could have done it himself if he was capable of actually committing to the full production. I don't doubt whatsoever he would have put in a really fantastic performance that he did with the original film, because he shows he was very capable of projecting what the character of the Gemini Killer needed to be in the scenes he portrayed it. Very creepy, very ominous, like he's very much a completely different performance than he was as Karras. Very convincing in that regard. So I thought Miller did a very effective job for what he did here, but there was a situation where basically Jason Miller was only on set for maybe a couple of days because they pretty much realized the struggles he was having and knew he couldn't complete the entire role himself. So one, that creates the split performance between him and Brad Dourif, Karras and the Gemini Killer underneath, but also the fact after they finish all the dialogue they needs to do for the entire film, still got several weeks of special effects shooting for the entire climax of the entire film. And so they brought in a body double from named Charles Powell, who do everything under prosthetics and makeup, who didn't get credit for it. And this is amazing because Morgan Creek wanted to promote Jason Miller, the Academy Award nominated actor from the original Exorcist, being involved with this film very deeply. They wanted to kind of promote it that way and not have this sort of thing where, oh, one guy's kind of doing part of his role here and he was only here for a couple of days doing this stuff. They really kind of create more of a, a glamour over the entire thing where just like it's Jason Miller kind of plastered in a way over the press materials saying he's prominent in the entire film. It's just a very heavy studio politicking situation he got caught in the middle of and some of the guys on the crew kind of treated him well afterwards, kind of gave him a little bit of a, a, a a dinner out and stuff like that to kind of talk with them and kind of smooth things over just to have a bit of a better impression on Hollywood than he really kind of got on this first production here. And of course, all the studio politics is basically why they removed Bly Dora from the entire film, why they wanted to reshoot the whole thing with Jason Miller is like, we want to have this being The Exorcist 3. We don't want Legion, you want Exorcist 3, you want to bring back the star for the original film and kind of go off in that direction to kind of promote it that way. And this seemed to further impact Colleen Dewhurst, who actually provided the voice for the demon at the end of the film, who was actually twice married and divorced from George C. Scott back in the 60s and 70s, but she also was not given credit for her work on the film. And it's such a weird type of thing how they did that, but the fact of the matter is, either way you cut it, either version of the entire film that you watch, Brad Dourif's performance is magnificently well done. And we know him so much as horror fans being fabulous in so many different things, but back in the 70s, he was already Oscar nominated for a supporting role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which also featured Louise Fletcher, who won for Best Leading Actress, who also appeared in Exodus to The Heretic, directed by John Borman, who also directed Excalibur, starring Nicole Williamson, famously as Merlin, who also appears in The Exorcist 3 as Father Paul Mourning, which is all part of the reshoots. There is no exorcism in the original novel or the Legion cut. It's only inserted here in the reshoots. They kind of wedge it in there to kind of say, well, we want to call it the Exorcist 3. It's not required us to actually put an exorcism into the entire film here. So that required all the reshoots, insertion of another character here where Bloody kind of threw a little bit of something in there. In the entire scene where you got Kinderman talking with Father Riley at the entire church there. They intentionally shot the entire thing. They kind of insert a character name in there to kind of have an, a loophole in there in case the studio wanted to get into that realm of inserting an exorcism somewhere. Let me just drop a hint to a character that I could kind of edit around if I have to, but it's there if I need it just in case the studio kind of pulls some things that kind of forces the issue. So that's the interesting type of thing on those different versions. But getting back to Brad Dourif here, goddamn, the fact that he does such amazing work in the entire film. 
And he's kind of replicated this entire thing back and forth someplace, like his role in the X-Files a couple years later. He's kind of playing a similar type of character here with sort of supernatural powers. He's a killer, locked up in a cell. Very kind of evocative of that type of thing. But the fact of the matter is him as a Gemini killer here. The guy crawls up on him, just going to like live in hell. Just the mesmerizing, hypnotic qualities he has. Almost shooting right down the barrel of the lens. Just like you're looking almost to like Kinderman's point of view here. And just seeing this performance unfold upon you in these long takes. Who famously that regards this. Like he captivates your attention so much with everything he's doing here. All the different ways he kind of pitches up his voice. Kind of sinks back down and kind of rages forward in some place. Like all these different volume levels and the intensity is kind of ratcheted up. and kind of pulled back in some places. Sometimes he draws you in further and sometimes he's out in front. Interesting way just Dwarf is so electric on this entire film. Delivering a performance that's just like one of the best he's ever done. And he's got so many incredible performances. His entire career here is impossible to list them off. Just like he does phenomenal work. And apparently he's not too much a guy who like kind of really enjoys watching himself on screen so much. And he's also an actor that kind of really needs to have a lot of rehearsal. Like when they brought him back for reshoots. After he already did the entire performance once and he got it called off and said you're not we're going to remove you from the film we're going with Jason Miller entirely then he gets another call up saying well it's not quite working out in that regard so we kind of need you to come back and kind of reshoot everything over again so we'll give you two days it's like I can't do this in two days you gotta give me three days and you gotta give me a personal assistant and basically he's a guy who's got to do it like 40 times is what he said he's got to run a line 40 times before it's absolutely put in his head rock solid concrete they can do it on the spot in the entire shoot so it's like a guy who needs a lot of work on that regard got to get it up on traction board back into his head to do it all over again and one of the main pretty much the main reason why they had to reshoot brad dorf subs that when they shot the scenes in north carolina they had one set that was kind of a much more of a gothic dungeon to a certain degree kind of equated towards hannibal lecter's cell in signs of the lambs Versus the much more clinical type of stuff he had for Brian Cox's Hannibal Lecter in Manhunter, which is the comparison I keep hearing about. And so when they did the reshoots over in Los Angeles, they kind of redesigned the thing as much more a padded cell. And so you can't use the same footage from before because it doesn't match the cell now. So <laughs> kind of made a problem for themselves when they brought on a completely different production team and design team and stuff like that when they did the reshoots and caused certain production problems where they just had to go back and spend more money and more time the reshoot a bunch of stuff that really was already shot they could have used if they just maintained a replica of the same set. When you look at the Legion cut, there's a little bit more of a subdued performance in some places. Like, it's kind of interesting. It's like it's all basically the same dialogue in both versions. And it's kind of hard as if you watch the Exodus 3 version so many times and you kind of watch in the Legion cuts, like it's the exact same dialogue just delivered slightly differently. It's kind of hard not to hear the echo of the other version in your head when you're watching it. But both performances are very exceptionally good. So very good. Just like different modulations on certain things here and there between the two different versions of it. But both of them deliver exactly what you need for this character at this point in time in the story here to lead you into the slight supernatural stuff, the slight demonic stuff, the slight madness of everything, the psychotic nature of it that he's such a captivating, charismatic personality. You're so enveloped by what he's doing. And the film doesn't really show you much of anything. You never really see much gore in the film. There's barely any blood whatsoever. It's all implied stuff. What they tell you happened to these guy, people. What he tells you he's done to other people himself. All this type of stuff, just like, as they're telling you it, usually films show not tell. But it's so effective what Blatty does here with this performance, with this character, all these different things, to not show you a bunch of gruesome stuff all over the place. That doesn't really sit well for Blatty to kind of show the decapitations and stuff like that. That really was something he was kind of pulling away from trying to shoot the film in a certain way where you don't really delve into that type of stuff. That wasn't his type of filmmaking. It wasn't his style of storytelling. But it's the fact that you see him relishing all this stuff, talking about all this gruesome stuff that he does to people, was such a delight. The fact that he's talking about Titus Andronicus, this entire Shakespeare play that I looked up, is absolutely ghastly. A ghastly story of revenge and just brutality and horrible, horrible things happening to people. And he's talking about it with such a glimmer. It's just like it's just a despicable, disgusting character portrayed with such zeal. 
It just shows the depth of evil this character absolutely is. And just, it's, it's magnificent what he does to create that performance because as you're not showing things, you have to have this character that projects something out on screen that not only captivates your attention, but bores into exactly how awful, how terrible, how horrifying what this guy does really is to someone like Kinderman. When he's talking about what he did to Dyer, smacks him across the nose and face and everything like that, breaks his nose. It just it elicits these reactions from a character like Kinderman and having Scott there react to those different things is the power in that scene. Because if it's just Brad Dourif doing that, it's like, man, this guy's fantastic doing this stuff. But you have to have the counterbalance of morality there and seeing what it means to hear about all this blood curdling crap through Kinderman's ears and through his eyes and all that type of stuff. It's just excellent, excellent type of stuff. What they did for the Gemini Killer and so on stuff in the novel, in terms of the dialogue, it's almost verbatim into the film. So it's just great, great stuff Blighty wrote for this entire thing. And Brad Dourif just absolutely taps into something just unreal all over the place in his performance for the film. But again, some of the supporting players in the entire film are very, very good. Again, Grandel Bush, fantastic character actor. You see him in Lethal Weapon, Die Hard, License to Kill, but like he's such a great sort of sidekick or whatnot to George C. Scott's Kinderman. It's like, He's got such a strong stage presence. It's just like you just feel a certain gravity from him just being there alongside Scott. Really good type of stuff from him. And of course, Scott Wilson as Dr. Temple was just like, this is perfect. This entire cast is so perfect. And just the fact that Temple is kind of a neurotic sensibility about himself. So it's like he's got, he's got some screws loose himself. He's been around all this type of stuff and he's kind of haunted by what the hell is going on with this Gemini killer sort of situation in the Desert Ward. And he's just very strange. I love, I love the art direction in his entire office. It's just puts you off so much. This guy's got some weird tastes, got some weird interests, and it's reflected so much in what Scott Wilson does with the character, where he is a bit kind of twitchy, kind of nervous in some place. Like when he's in that scene in the office talking with Kinderman, kind of reading off the, the speech that's written down, man, he's just kind of all over the place. He's just kind of like, really skittish about kind of dealing with things where he's kind of putting out the cigarette. It's just, just all these interesting nervous tics the character has because he's so terrified of what is sitting in the freaking cell over there. It's great. He's great. It's fantastic. Just bordering on the little bit comedic side. I like the fact that Blaze is kind of playing a couple of characters here. They're not outright comedy, but they've got certain characteristics that could play towards that end with still a dramatic sensibility kind of mixed into everything. Temple's still a character is involved with a dramatic narrative, but he kind of plays things a little bit kitschy. He's a little bit off kilter or whatnot. He's a nice, interesting, distinct character, cast so very well. And the very interesting thing, aside from the, the things with the Gemini killings in San Francisco, he actually doesn't die in the novel. He doesn't take his own life. He actually has sort of a psychotic meltdown or whatnot. He gets put in like the psych ward himself, so he's still alive, but he's not in the best mental faculties by the end of the entire story there. So I mean, it's a nice way to kind of sever the character in an interesting way that kind of gives more weight to Venom in himself. Having his influence upon Temple, who was kind of pulling the strings of Temple. Kind of a puppet master in that regard, kind of playing on his fears and his trepidations. Really interesting type of stuff to have that character react that type of way and act with Kinderman in that regard and have that sort of being a element of how the story has progressed and how Temple was used as a puppet in that regard by the Gemini Killer. So great stuff in that regard. And just like everyone in the entire cast does a wonderful, fantastic job overall. There's not a misbeat, not a miscasting. Nurse Allerton, she's fantastic. That actress does a wonderful job bouncing off of Scott so much. It just starts start so much with that screenwriting that Blighty was so, so adept at making such rich, well-rounded characters with interesting stories for themselves and interesting journeys to take through those stories, all that type of stuff. It's wonderful, wonderful cast that just nails it like living hell. And of course, in living up to the legacy of The Exorcist, one thing you really do have to have are some iconic scenes of horror and suspense. And Blighty delivers it so much. The, the fact that the hallway sequence is just iconic in its own right is amazing. Just the fact of what he does here. Again, sparse minimalism. He's not doing a whole lot, but he's doing plenty to creep you the hell out. 
just had this long static shot down the hallway there. A few little creaking, cracking sounds on the soundtrack. There's nothing else really happening. Just a few people moving around the whole thing. The nurse Amy Kidding kind of looking around, trying to go into the other room and have the false jump scare. That's a good type of thing. You kind of build them up a little bit, get a little tense and whatnot, then you kind of release it before you get a little bit off center, a little bit off the beat of whatnot. When the entire thing happens, when she goes into the room that Dyer was killed in, and the, the entire thing, just the, the stinger, the zoom in, the white gown, every, the, everything is perfect. The entire timing is perfect. The staging is perfect. The design of everything with the giant shears, perfect type of stuff. Everything is brilliant. Just 100% on the money. One of the best jump scares that's ever been put together on cinema. It just, just, he knows exactly what the hell he's doing. That's the guy, he's only made one other film, directed only one other film, and he knows it this well. Learn from Freakin. He definitely learned from Freakin. I could definitely see Freakin doing something along this way. The way he used sound in the original film, but he learned some things here and there. He learned how to use those types of skills and try to draw the audience in and kind of get them a little bit on pins and needles without doing a whole lot, but you're doing plenty here, like I said. It's a wonderful sequence that's just, words just don't do it justice. It's fantastic, brilliant, terrifying. So much than the aftermath, finding out what the killer did to her. Opening her up and putting rosaries in her. It's like, oh my Christ. Just and after the terror's on, you're still getting creepy crawly all over yourself just thinking about what's been done. Oh my lord, all this type of stuff. Then the entire thing with Mrs. Clayley on the ceiling. I am, I still don't know how they did this sequence. I, I've heard that there, there's an optical matte painting, there's like an optical composite shot, but that's the one of the cleanest optical composites I've ever seen. I know they're using VistaVision for part of the sequences that were done in reshoots, but for this sequence, I don't really know how they achieved this so well, just the fact they got the white shot where she's crawling on the ceiling and everything like that, where they did kind of shoot things and flip them all over around, but when you've got the camera moving underneath Kinderman and then she's moving around up there, and then the, I don't know how the, how the hell they do that. Was there a rig for the actress up on top there? I don't know exactly what they did, but it looks phenomenal and as creepy as all live in hell. Just like, holy Christ, just like, that's the moment where the, the film is expressly telling you, yeah, things are going a little bit towards the paranormal, a little bit more supernatural evils. Things are just tipping off much further, much more overtly towards that end. We're no longer teasing you as much. It's getting on that level here. It's getting right up on that type of thing that the original film was so prevalent with while doing it in a much more fresher way. It's not doing the same tricks. You don't want to do the same tricks, but he's not going to pull the same crap. He's not writing the same story. So he's doing different things that kind of creep you the living hell out and just phenomenal type of stuff, how he does that. And of course, the entire sequence where the nurse of sorts in disguise goes to Kinderman's home with the shears and everything, that's not in the novel. That's not in the novel. His daughter, Julie, never gets attacked with shears. And it's kind of a weird type of thing. When you have it in the Legion cut, where they have the exact same sequence, but the, the nurse kind of falls down and you don't really have a main motivation of why it happens. In the theatrical cut, it's because Morning shows up and he's gonna do the exorcism and stuff like that. That kind of is a catalyst for why the possession of the, the, the catatonic kind of falls away and kind of sinks back into the entire cell there. In the Legion cut really is far more ambiguous. It just seems like uh, Veneman just kind of pulls back on it for no real reason and doesn't really quite work as well because I don't know if they would have shot a different sequence for that. I don't know if that was specifically shot for the later cut or from the earlier cut. I don't know exactly how it kind of fat fit in there. And apparently there are many, many different drafts of the screenplay that are vastly different from one another. So a little hard to pin down exactly what was going on there, but apparently Mark Kermode famously very much a good friend of Bill Blatty's and produced the Fear of God 25 Years of the Exorcist documentary and actually published with some of the foreword on it by him an actual screenplay of the Exorcist and Legion together. So that kind of helped when Screen Factory went off and did the Legion cut to get things from as many available sources as they could. Most of it was from videotaped dailies of the film and kind of splice that in where they could to kind of reconstruct as close as possible 
what Blatty had intended for the film before they did all the reshoots. Now, a lot of the footage was lost. A lot of the stuff they wanted to use for it was not available on these videotape daily, so it's a close approximation of it. It's not as much of what Blatty would have wanted if he had all the materials available to him, but it's a close approximation of what was intended. And that original opening that I've been mentioning throughout the entire video here where Kinnerman's in 75 here in the morgue and looking at the body carrots and stuff like that is not actually part of the Legion cut. It's a separate feature on the Blu-ray set, but I'm very much of the thing that I, I would have liked that actually in the cut of the entire film here because I think it sets things up very nicely because you're starting it right after the events of the original Exorcist having these characters being established as new actors in the roles. It's a nice type of just connective tissue there. I really like the quality of the entire sequence there and how Blade was kind of like deciding to make kind of the opening sequence of the entire film all in black and white and kind of move into color gradually as you go through the opening title sequence and stuff like that. I kind of like that quality in that regard. And as you go through the Legion Cut, obviously, like I said, because a lot of stuff is stories from videotape masters, you kind of have this switching of qualities whatnot from 35 millimeter film over to analog video source type of stuff. And that's not really, visually, that's not really a problem for me too much. I think it's much more the fact that you're getting a lot of raw production audio. It's very hissy and it's not really been done, nothing's really been done with it, kind of process it out or kind of, you can do some noise filters and stuff like that to kind of tweak it out in certain ways, kind of minimize it to a certain degree to kind of maybe add a bit more of divorce on score and there's some place here and there, add some of those growls or something else like that underneath the scenes with Dorf in the cell there. So I think it's the only thing that kind of detracts from it in, as a presentation in a certain way. It's more the audio end of things than not so much the video end of things. I really can, work on just fine and the few pieces of actual film they actually found is very very minimal to kind of reintegrate the entire edit here but certain footage gets repurposed <laughs> for the theatrical cut because actually part way through the film they have all that stuff they're digging up Karis's grave where in the theatrical cut it's presented as them burying Karis at the end of the entire film there so they actually earlier it's the entire storyline about Brother Fane which has an additional scene with Father Riley with Kinderman talking about him just disappearing one day and, and talking about like, oh, he always wanted to move over to Kentucky to be with his family and whatnot. We thought, oh, he just up and disappeared some way and just kind of passed away back with his family sometime. And then it follows on when the Gemini Killer actually says, oh, when I crawled on the grave, old brother Fane, he suffered another heart attack and he, it was a hilarious experience for him and stuff like that. So it did a nice setup to the payoff later on in the Legion cut. So there's a lot of things built up in that regard and it's saying like, yeah, the guy we found in the grave isn't Karis and evidence shows towards the autopsy the guy had two heart attacks before the final one that killed him and fell in the grave and got buried. So there's a nice little extra piece of the subplot there that I kind of like those that little scene there. And so these little edit bits and pieces all over the entire place where they have extra scenes with Kinderman and Dyer in the tombs early on in the entire film, there's just a little bit more character added into these discussions and the conversation of the characters. As a theatrical cut's a lot more stampy with his pacing, Legion cut kind of lingers a little bit more, kind of just lets you sit with the characters and certain ideas a little bit longer and not kind of worry so much about quick rapid fire type of stuff going on from one scene to the next. Kind of lets you soak into it a little bit more in some places here, but it's just an interesting cut to the whole thing. It's like one of those things, like when I first watched it back when it was released in 2016, it's like, it left me a little bit hanging. The entire ending of the film was just a little lackluster. As you get the entire ending of the whole thing where, as I said, the entire thing with the shears at Kinderman's home kind of deflates to a certain degree for no particular reason we seem. It's kind of an indication maybe like Damien Karras inside of Gemini Killer is kind of pulling the strings, but we've had no indication that there's a soul of Karis anywhere in the film. So it's just kind of thing that Kinderman kind of goes back to the cell, has a little bit of dialogue exchange with the Gemini Killer and just pulls out his gun and kills him. It's very anticlimactic. There's not a real catharsis of thematic material right at the end of the whole thing to really confront things. As I said with the original novel, it's the whole thing where this entire thread goes on much more deeply explored about the Gemini Killer, his brother Thomas, and his father Carl, and as Carl passes away that same day, then the Gemini Killer's like, well, I have no real reason to go on because now the guy I've been shaming all this time, he's now dead. So it's kind of like, it kind of, it, it kind of takes the rug out from underneath. It's like, oh, I can't, I can't shame him anymore because he's not around to be shamed by it. So it's just that kind of thing that kind of deflates, but 
to a degree that the stuff in the novel works a little bit better because you have much more substance of that story going on underneath everything like that. So there's at least a explanation. There's a certain thing that feels like it kind of follows a thread, even though it's not the best type of thing. It still feels like it has a little bit more going for it, a little bit more of a consistent thread through the entire story here to kind of pay off the entire thing instead of just walks in, shoots him, and he's dead. It just feels like it's a little less than something. It's like, it's more than the novel to a certain degree in terms of the wrap up of the conflict between the two characters there, but it's still not quite as much. The theatrical cut is almost too much. It's one of those things where I, when I, the first couple of times I watched The Exorcist 3, it's like, I loved the entire thing, but it's like, I always felt like there was a little bit of a disconnect with the ending, the entire climax here. And obviously that's because when the studio decided, like, we want to promote this as The Exorcist 3, we have the rights to promote it that way. We want to retire from Legion or The Exorcist 3. One, we need you to put an exorcism in the entire thing. And then the entire batting around, like, oh, we want to get a star from the original film in here. So we're going to throw out Brad Dourif stuff, we're going to get in Jason Miller, and then we find all the stuff that Jason Miller really is entirely capable of doing everything they need to. And so they get in this entire web of reshoots and more money they got to throw at things. And as, as I've already explained in that regard, but it's just the fact that when you get out the entire thing, it's like they go so grandiose. It, it doesn't quite feel the same as the rest of the film, which is so minimal. Like I've said, not really showing you so much. It's really much implied type of stuff. It's just kind of creeping up under your skin with the mood and the atmosphere, the, the quality of the direction here, all the different things that Blighty is doing here to evoke certain emotions from you as the audience and not really kind of plaster things all over the screen. But it was the fact that matter when the reshoots came along, Blighty really didn't want to do this stuff, but he felt like, well, if I don't do it myself, they're going to get someone else to do it. I might as well be involved with it and actually shoot it myself. So I'm at least there and I'm present. I can at least put a stamp on it to a certain degree saying, yes, I was there. I shot it. I might not have agreed with it entirely, but at least I was the guy there shooting it and had a hand in making it happen. So I think that's an admirable thing about Blatty. You still maintain the control because you're not just shooting all this grandiose special effects stuff. You're going back, you're shooting all the stuff with Jason Miller, you're shooting all the stuff with Brad Dourif, all the stuff you ha have to shoot on George C. Scott's end of the whole thing. So it's like, you've got to maintain that quality of direction with the actors and the dramatic performances and kind of deal with the special effects stuff later on where they kind of brought in some other people. They didn't have the exact same crew involved in the whole thing. Not the same cinematographer, not the same production designer, stuff like that. And they brought in two different crews. One to do the regular like dramatic scenes and then a special effects unit. They shoot all the grandiose stuff going on the whole thing. And apparently it was Norman Reynolds brought on a second unit director where he's usually a production designer. He worked on the Star Wars trilogy. He worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark, Superman the movie. He worked on the Brian De Palma's Mission Impossible that I recently covered. And so they brought him as a second unit director and also Ron Colby came in as a sort of production manager for the entire reshoots here. And kind of worked with Peter Sashutsky who was a cinematographer who actually shot The Empire Strikes Back. They kind of review all the footage and trying to figure out what did and didn't work and what they need to actually kind of do to kind of improve things in some places. And Kind of interesting thing that Chisuski actually shot all the dialogue sequences, not the special effects stuff. Oddly enough, Chisuski doesn't have any credits on the entire film. I checked IMDb, I checked the credits of the entire film. There's nothing. Again, another guy doesn't get credit for his work. Whatever the case was, I don't know what the reason was why certain people worked on the film and didn't get credit for it. When it really was kind of inconsequential to not give him credits. Like, why not just say, hey, this guy worked on another unit. Films have multiple units all the time. Second units, third units, depends on the size of production. Really, no one really criticizes it that degree, unless it comes out well. So it's just an interesting mishmash of like a lot of different production issues that kind of piled up on top of one another because the studio kept putting their fingers into everything and kind of stirring up the pot to a certain degree and throwing other materials in here. It's like, oh, that doesn't quite work, so I got to kind of pull this thing back in and all that type of stuff. A lot of mess of certain things. And so they kind of approach things with Blatty kind of going ahead and actually writing everything that he was kind of tasked with doing in that regard and they just went off and shot these elaborate grandiose sort of climax i hate to keep using the same word, word over and over again but it really is a very lavish production in that regards like so many things are so bold it's like it's very powerful very powerful imagery it all thought flows through with everything that's started up and, and talked about the entire film with the entire thing with the kindry boy and him being decapitated with a Head of Christ and the minstrel so blackface type of stuff, all this stuff. It's, it's just showing you all those things that the film has not shown you up to this point. So, to a certain degree, 
it works in that regard. Okay, we held everything back to kind of show you everything in the climax. That works to a certain artistic uh, execution to a certain degree, and though again, wasn't what Blighty's intention was, but the fact is, it kind of works to his own credit in that regard. So they threw in a bunch of really impressive special effects here, and they're using VisVision, like I said, which is a very high-resolution film format to make sure that whatever they're doing with composites or anything like that really could maintain that quality going forward. But there's one particular special effect that they did for it that did not make it up into either cut of the film, but it's in the trailer. And it's an entire head morphing sequence where the Gemini killer, as I guess the exorcism is going on, it starts morphing between all these different people. It's kind of possessed over the point in time, which I always found fascinating. I thought it was a really interesting effect to see in the whole thing that one, this was seeing the trailer before the Legion cut even existed. So that kind of stirred up the sort of myth around the entire film. But then when it came to the Screen Factory disc, there wasn't even a hint of that footage anywhere. And apparently it was because Blade just didn't think the special effect came off very well. It was just a lot of things that just probably just didn't have time to finesse it or do anything more with it because they were pouring probably a good amount of money into the reshoots as it was. And so it just kind of got pulled out at a certain point in time. But it was just such a fascinating type of thing and just the quality of the special effects you're doing in the whole thing was very, very good between the makeup effects, the much more elaborate sort of visual effects in the whole thing. It's a very impressive sequence on that technical level there, even though there's a lot of things in it that just don't mesh with the entire vibe of the rest of the film in a certain way. But the couple of visual effects we got early on in the entire film, such as the entire real surreal dream sequence, which has some very bizarre cameos. It's got like... Patrick Ewing, NBA star, he's the angel of death. You've got Fabio showing up. There's a little bit of Samuel L. Jackson there, even though he's dubbed over, but he's the blind man talking in the whole thing. And just a very peculiar sequence overall. And of course, when they're in the tombs earlier, Larry King has a cameo. Steve Coop, who is the former United States Surgeon General, he also has a cameo in there. I don't know. I guess Bloody just knew all these people and just threw them in the film to a certain degree. But just that dream sequence, it, it does have a bit of a different context in the novel where is Kinderman having a dream regarding his dead brother. It has nothing to do with Father Dyer. It happens well before Dyer even goes into the hospital or something else like that. So it's very much recontextualized here to have much more of a appearing into sort of soul way station before they've gone off to heaven or hell or anything like that. Just when they're just transcending into that next level of reality in a certain way. So it's just interesting, real fascinating dream sequence that just has so much interesting painterly qualities about the mad paint they have there everything they have them just designed the whole thing it's very impressive in that regard but when you're looking towards this entire climax here going between the two different versions here it's a difference between not having quite enough and maybe having a little too much of a certain degree like i said before the one thing the theatrical ending has is that sort of discourse the interactions between the gemini killer and kinderman there creating a little bit of a thematic catharsis overall for the entire ideas going on the whole film about faith and belief and nature of evil around us just the existence of it overall just to have that address of all the things that have kind of culminated up to the point where kind of has gone through this experience seeing all these things that i really wouldn't have believed in beforehand but now it's come to a point of actually accepting it one way or another so that's where the theatrical cut adds something more where the legion cut just lacks something overall and just like as they've navigate around all these production problems that kind of readjust the story to have partial Jason Miller there, partially as Karras, partially as the Gemini killer, Brad Dourif there fully as the Gemini killer, and weave into this entire climax here to talk about this entire thing, to actually have a bit of Karras' soul come back out at the end of the entire film to break the entire possession to a certain degree and just like be able to free Karras in that moment where he's trapped in the body of this whole thing and so on and so forth. So it's these really interesting type of things, how they kind of did these weird script writing and gymnastics and whatnot that kind of land on an ending that actually fits for everything they kind of threaded through this entire reshot version of the entire film here. So you can see that with all the stuff that's going on and how they kind of can change the things from one beat to the next as they start reshoots, it could really come up to a horrible mess. But I think with Blatty maintaining his own involvement here, being the guy to write the new stuff, shoot the new stuff, direct the new stuff, all that type of stuff, be involved 100% of the way, it still maintains a lot of his quality. 
his quality of the writing of the characters, the presentation of the characters, all those different things, the ideas that are involved in the entire story here still come through, even though they don't really mesh with everything that we want to do direction-wise. I still think everything in the theatrical cut ending is good. There's a lot of good stuff there, and though a lot of people say there's no, there has no business being there with an exorcism in the entire thing, it works for me. It still works for me. I, 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 I can see all the different arguments back and forth between two different versions as she had gone through the book and looked at both versions of the entire film. There's a lot of stuff packed into my head about the information in the entire film as you've gone through in this video. There's a lot of fascinating stuff in this entire thing. I would definitely implore you to read the book. Grab everything you want about this whole thing because there's a lot of fascinating stuff involved with what Blighty brought to this entire story here. Everything. Everything he did in the book is so very interesting. It's very theological, very philosophical type of stuff here and there, delving much further into ideas and themes and stuff like that, and kind of streamlining things a little bit here for the film, either version of it. They kind of just bore it down to kind of the essentials. Because there's, an, again, there's far more, again, theological talk in the entire thing where Kinderman finally comes up at the end of the story in the novel where he kind of comes to a, a epiphany, believing that the entire universe, all matter in the universe, is Lucifer trying to crawl itself back to God. It's very interesting type of stuff that could only really come from Platy pulling these ideas and weaving them all around this very fascinating story of faith and belief and insight of the human experience and stuff like that to come to those interesting conclusions and you felt like I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sell this film so much to these studio executives who don't quite grasp everything quite so well. I'm having a hard time just keeping an exorcism out of the entire thing. You, you think you're going to actually buy the entire thing of me telling them that the, the matter of the universe is the dispersal of Lucifer kind of rolling his back, way back up to heaven? It's a little too much. It felt like it was, it was just too heady of an idea to pull together and throw in the entire thing so he kind of kept that out of the final version of the whole thing. But all these interesting type of things. And The Exorcist 3 is a film I've loved for a very, very long time. And the fact that it fits very nicely in this entire lineage of like horror detector thriller type of stuff, like Angel Heart or Fallen or Seven or a couple other things here. And there's like, there's always this little thread of religion in all these different films. And they kind of fit in very nicely one, one after another here. It's just interesting type of stuff overall. It's like a really good type of thing. I can see this being a very strong sort of influence. A lot of other films like this falling on from here. So I think that, think that the whole thing is like the Legion Cut is a very good thing to have. Like Mark Kermode said, like, if they ever find the actual film materials or even more materials from this actual version we have now to kind of reconstruct things with actual film elements, if they ever get found, interesting type of stuff. I think there's a lot, obviously there's been a lot to discuss. If you've ever going through the novel. If you watch the Legion Cut, of course, the proper theatrical version of The Exorcist 3, I want to hear all your comments. I want to hear all your opinions about the whole thing, how things stack up. Which version strikes you the best? Which one do you feel works the best? Is there anything that kind of doesn't work in one version over the other? It's like, there's a lot of things to compare back and forth about how you feel about the Legion Cut. Does it work as a complete thing? It's a lot better than like the Richard Donner Cup of Superman 2. I think it's a much more complete proper version of a narrative there than that thing was, which is kind of cobbled together with a lot of disparate parts or whatnot. This is at least a lot of the stuff that was filmed, but it's kind of like sourced from different elements or whatnot, but still a lot of stuff that actually filmed on the set and constructed for the entire thing. So there's a lot of stuff. Just let me know guys, because there's a super thanks feature to contribute anything directly through YouTube, that anything you especially love here, the Patreon to get a little early access and contribute some things to the channel in that regard. Of course, liking, sharing, commenting, all that type of stuff. If you haven't subscribed already, absolutely, guys. So there's so much to get up on the entire channel here. So thanks so much, guys, for checking things out here. And hopefully see you around soon. So, guys, thanks so much. Take care.